We're now going to have the reading of our word and then John's going to come up and um, preach for us. Good morning. The uh, clue for our reading this morning is on the front of your sheet. The workers in the vineyard from Matthew chapter 20, 1 to 16. And I'm reading from the NIV. For the kingdom is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said and you have made them equal to us who have been borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hard hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May the Lord bless his word to us as John comes to explain some of it to us. (laughs) Let's pray to John. Dear Lord, we pray for your blessing on John as he speaks to us. And we pray that you will bless us and challenge each one of us as we consider your words to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. With a bit of luck, we've got a PowerPoint. Oh, there we are. Great. When we used to um, do the uh, parables of Jesus for our small children, they got on pretty well with it, by and large until we got to this one and then when we read it they said it's not fair (laughs) Uh, some of you might be thinking the same thing Um, what it does show is that children have an innate belief in God until our schools educated out of them but understanding grace needs the Holy Spirit so uh, let's see how we get on today is actually a, a rather special day for me because as far as I can work it out 59 years ago to the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. (laughs) I will claim my suite later. (laughs) But that does mean that you're going to get some testimonies today, whether you want it or not. Uh, Because I'd like to start off by giving some taste of what it's like to be a labourer in God's vineyard, even as an odd job man. Because it's quite an adventure. When I was 10, uh, my dad thought it would be enjoyable for me to go to the Guildford Crusader Bible class. Uh, My dad was not a Christian to my lifelong regret, but he had had a tremendous amount from it, from Guildford Crusaders in the late 1920s and 30s. And he was right. It was fantastic. 
The first thing I sensed was a great sense of freedom, um, a kind of godly anarchy, I suppose you'd call it. And um, three things that I remember that come to mind as early lessons. The first was that, um, well, apart from the fact that the leaders were inspirational and the, uh, the older Christian kids were role models, but that immediate sense of freedom um, gave me a healthy scepticism about human authorities, which has stood me in good stead, uh, particularly as our country has become a propaganda nation and is rapidly becoming a police state, or classical. But uh, the second thing it taught me to hymn, sing hymns too fast, which uh, Anthony's been trying to beat out of me for the past 10 years without much success. And the third thing it, I learned was how to throw a piano from an out, upstairs window, um, which ought to be on everybody's bucket list. But the core message of Crusaders, at first, I found actually quite offensive, because I had always assumed I would go to heaven because I kept my nose fairly clean at school and didn't tell too many lies at home. But they told me that my sin actually made me an enemy of God. And that the only remedy was to repent of my sins, to trust in the shed blood on the cross of Jesus and in his resurrection, and to make him Lord of my life. And they didn't teach me that in Sunday school. So I was quite slow to accept it, but as time went by, I began to... Um, well, that's it. That's, that's me, by the way. <laughs> Haven't changed a bit, have I? <laughs> and that was Crusaders back in the day. Um, so I was quite slow to accept this idea, but uh, it began to kind of make more sense as time went by, and it was certainly what Jesus was teaching in the Bible. One reason I delayed was that a number of the kids I knew, particularly at the camps, were joyfully saying that they'd become Christians and seemed to go right back to being the way they were when we got back to school. And I thought, I don't want to be like that. I thought, uh, like in the words of the song, if I fall in love, it will be forever, or I'll never fall in love. Um, and it seemed to me that uh, I had to think really carefully about that step. But as we got towards the end of the camp, 1965, when I was 13, I thought, look, I've got to make that decision, now or never. Who knows whether the opportunity might uh, never come again. And I could see that my older brother was moving away from Christian things, and I thought that could happen to me too. So it was the last tent meeting of that camp when I responded to the message and gave my life to Jesus. I didn't find out till half a century later that the padre of the camp who gave that talk was actually a member of Kilmington Baptist Church. So thank you, Kilmington, for my faith. Uh, there he is. Some of the older ones might remember Bruce. Um, some of the very old ones, okay. And as soon as I... And I'm not quite sure how, what um, prayer I prayed, but it was probably uh, very much in line with the Crusader cho chorus that we used to sing, which went like this. The Lord has need of me, his soldier I will be. He gave, myself, gave himself my life to win, and so I mean to follow him and serve him faithfully. So although the fight be fierce and long, I'll carry on, he makes me strong. And then one day his face I'll see, and oh the joy when he says to me, Well done, my brave crusader. And as soon as I prayed that prayer, Absolutely nothing seemed to change. But I started to do the things that Christian do, Christians do. Started having a quiet time with praying and reading my Bible, initially from notes, and then that didn't sort of work out well, so I wrote my own notes, and I've still got sort of files of those at home just to remind me how little I knew back then. I went to the school Christian Union more than I had, and I joined the Crusaders uh, Bible studies on Friday nights. But I had no ambition to be a missionary. I had no ambition to be a minister. Uh, in fact, the only ambitions I had at that stage were to, first of all, to be David Attenborough and study exotic animals in far-off countries. And the second thing was maybe to have enough money one day to buy a guitar. Um, but 
people began to ask me to do things. Um, that year I led my first Bible study, I can remember it was on 2 Timothy, and they taught us to lead Bible studies from the Bible and not from a textbook, which was really good training, and I've been doing that on and off ever since. Uh, two years later, some idiot asked me to run the school Junior Christian Union, which I did very badly. And in my last year, uh, I was asked to lead the school Christian Union, and I did that equally badly, I think. Yeah. Proud of my record, it's consistent. Off to university, and I did medicine, thinking that was probably a bit more Christian than being David Attenborough. <laughs> Maybe. Um, and at the end of that first year, a friend at another university, uh, knowing I played guitar, because I'd got one by then, invited me to do a um, coffee bar mission in his native Minehead, just along the road from here. And although I had no extraordinary exp uh, spiritual experience that week, that fortnight, I came out of it on fire for the Lord, and in particular, knowing in my heart that the Bible was the living word of God. And that has never left me ever since. Um, and that, that is fantastic. And the other thing that happened, which is a kind of interesting story, but out of that fortnight directly, I acquired a ministry of uh, gospel singer-songwriting um, going around the country. And I did about 150 gigs in four years uh, until we got married. Uh, so that was an opportunity. I also had the chance to do some Christian street theatre with a bunch of friends that later went on to become the first Christian drama group called Riding Lights, who've been here. So I went on to medical school, back to the real world, and um, I got asked to lead the Christian Union at Westminster Hospital, which I did a little better, I think, than I did at school. And I was even asked to join the PCC, the parochial church council of our local of the church we went to, which was a, a little fellowship called Holy Trinity Brompton. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I declined that because we were moving away from London, but I, I, it's interesting to speculate if I'd still stayed in London the following year, I might very well have been helping, very well have been helping to write the first Alpha course, which um, actually fell to a Cambridge contemporary of mine called Charles Marnham. Uh, so, moving on, after GP training, I ended up in an awful job in Kent. But somebody asked me to join the Christian practice in Chelmsford, where I trained. And just, I'm getting asked to do things, I'm not doing much volunteering here. And I stayed there for the rest of my career. But I still kept getting asked to do new things. I got asked to help form a pregnancy counselling service uh, over there in Chelmsford, which is still operating 40 years later. I was asked to lead the worship band for a city-wide mission in Chelmsford in 1986. Uh, and that seems to have led to leading worship on and off ever since. And thinking through um, the Bible's theology of worship, which is actually quite different from what we often think it is. And then again, somehow Synth and I found ourselves... How have we got on? Oh, that's... Okay. I forgot the little donger. That's the, the Bible study group I was in in 1966 or something. Uh, that was a coffee bar in Minehead. You see the, the bloke in the middle with the guitar? Uh, hasn't changed a bit. And that's uh, the, the gospel singer, songwriter. I haven't changed a bit, have I? <laughs> Actually, members of the Bible study group, I mean, will notice I'm still using the same guitar. And that's the street theatre company that, uh, that went on to become Riding Lights. Okay, and that's the practice in Chelmsford where, uh, where I spent so much misspent time. So then we got asked to do, I don't know who asked us to do that, Synth and I found ourselves organising a performance of Make Way, uh, Graham Kendrick's uh, Make Way, for the Chelmsford Carnival, with a cast of thousands. Um, look, there's our float, and all those people behind it are, are, are the Christians from all the churches in Chelmsford, and we ended up winning the, uh, the event. Uh, I'm still to this day not sure how we, why we did it, you know, but somebody must have asked us, I suppose. Um, but I remember years later, uh, a Muslim patient who always, when she ever she came, said, remembered the time her GP sang about God in the carnival. Uh, notice, though, that like a good, any good professional soldier, I never volunteered for anything. 
But God sent all sorts of odd jobs anyway, and there is never a dull moment in serving Christ. And the only ambition uh, that I'd had, that I wanted to do, particularly since that 1971 experience of the coffee bar, was to preach and teach some of the stuff that I'd been getting from God's word. And for 16 years, nobody asked me. Until, following a kind of tr rather traumatic change of church, we went along to this new church for the first time, and I was introduced to one of the elders, who was a guy called Eric Gahagan, very godly man and a, a leading light in the Gideons. Uh, and the first thing he said to me was, when are you going to come and preach? I thought, this is an interesting church. <laughs> you, you turn up and they ask you to preach. But I did end up preaching over 300 times uh, over the next 20 years uh, in their teaching team. Uh, ten years an elder, and the first decade we didn't have a full-time pastor, so it was kind of uh, hot stuff. And we saw growth, much like we have been seeing here. There are a few years ahead of us, but see where they're going. Um, and it's the fruits of the teaching the Bible fearlessly in the power of the Spirit. While we were there for 20 years, the church grew from about 100 to 250. The youth from virtually nothing to a solid base. They've gone through three rebuilds in the time up to now. They've done a church plant which has outgrown its, or outgrown its um, home twice. And they've just gone over to doing two services in the morning, like we're going to do, is it next week or the week after next? So it's going to be good. And even then, I got asked to do new stuff. Oh, that's, that's, that's the old fellowship, Danbury in Essex. Even then, I got asked to do new stuff. Um, I subscribed to a magazine called Prophecy Today, and I wrote to the, the editor, Clifford Hill, um, basically criticising a number of the articles in one issue, and I expected him to cancel my subscription. Instead, he asked me to join the editorial board, which, and I ended up working for them for 15 years until just after we moved here. So I'll round off what happened after I retired and moved here. Um, I started to study the interface between science and faith, and in 2011, an academic philosopher in Canada suggested I started a blog, um, which is still running. We're getting about 90,000 hits a year. We're big in the USA, big in Singapore, big in Russia, fairly big in England, uh, not so much in Kilmington for some reason. I don't know why that would be. <laughs> but at the same time, a little bit later, um, another... Uh, yeah, a historian of science in Philadelphia, <laughs> the way these things happen, asked me, said I, suggested I write a book on creation doctrine. And after much shilling and shallying, that came out in 2019. And a little bit afterwards, uh, a computational biologist from St. Louis suggested I write a book on Adam. And that was out the following year, just in time to be buried in the COVID nonsense. So um, my life now is the solitary life of a writer. And that's just a small part of the adventures that Jesus found for an undersized 13-year-old who liked biology and music. But to quote Queen, it's been no bed of roses, no pleasure cruise. Um, many of you will know uh, that becoming a Christian can sometimes create antagonism from your family and from your friends. Anybody recognize that? My parents were very really keen that I enjoyed Crusaders. When I became a Christian, they thought I was a fanatic. <laughs> they were possibly right, but uh, it's lasted. But more than that, I mean, there are, there are times when it's quite hard. It's quite hard to be denounced from the pulpit for calling on a self-righteous church to repent. It's not easy uh, dealing with police and social services when one of the leading members of your congregation, of which you're an elder, is found to have been um, abusing young men. And it's actually no fun suffering depressive symptoms for several years from burnout. And yet, I don't regret a single day of any of it, because after all, as I said at the time to myself, you can't be on active service for half a century 
and expect to go away without any war wounds, can you? Because I signed up to be a soldier for Christ, and uh, in Romans 8, Paul makes our sharing in Christ's glory conditional on our sharing in his sufferings. And so we're going to find in our Christian life that there's tremendous joy, that there's tremendous variety, but there can also be tremendous pain. And I would not change a single day. And that brings us neatly back to our parable. Uh, um, you remember that Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. So since I've worked in the vineyard, uh, since the time when all the grapes went into blue nun wine, and contemporary Christian music was the joy strings, <laughs> I think I ought to get a big white mansion with wrought iron gates and a gravel drive and an Aston Martin, yeah? <laughs> After all, the self-styled apostles over in America do that for false prophecy, fake miracles and spiritually abusive teaching, so why not me for defending God's faith, God's truth? No? Well, at least a gold long service medal um, with a sort of presentation ceremony like the end of Star Wars, that would be good. No? no? At least a tear-jerking eulogy at my funeral. No. I signed up for that back in 1965, and that is what I will get. Then one day his face I'll see, and oh, the joy when he says to me, well done, my brave crusader. The prophet Jeremiah said to his scribe, Baruch, said, uh, Seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. Because it's not as if uh, I've had a particularly long or meritorious service. A few weeks ago at Luffwood, Rachel over there was saying that she became a Christian at the age of four. And she's now 80-something that I'm too polite to remember. And she had a proper job as a missionary. So perhaps she should get a personal jet in her gravel drive, yeah? <laughs> but I think you'll find that she signed up for much the same reward that I did. At the same service, um, Barry was regretting uh, that he, he will, uh, the, the years, how long it took him to become a Christian. But your calling was in the Lord's time. And those Christless years are never wasted in God's economy, but they are redeemed. And God seems to want some Christians with tattoos as well. <laughs> so the wages are the same for all, and I'm going to use the rest of my time explaining why, despite my children, it's not unfair. Okay. The first reason it's not unfair is that although Jesus has given me many jobs to do, I have not done any of them particularly well. Um, a few weeks ago, again, Mike was confessing that uh, at times when the devil discourages him, he kind of thinks back to the time he was a Christian and kind of wishes he could you know, never go back to those places again. Because when you become a Christian at the age of 13, it's a bit difficult to talk about a life of debauchery and <laughs> excess um, before that. The trouble is, of course, that the devil can get at you because all your bad sins come after your conversion. Call yourself a Christian, he says. And so I've had besetting sins. I've had times of backsliding. I've had conversations I should have had but didn't. And conversations I shouldn't have had but did. In my job, I've had patients who died who might have lived if I had done things differently. I've had times when I taught fashionable evangelical ideas rather than taking the trouble and having the courage to teach what the Bible says, however unpopular it might be. But Jesus isn't the kind of employer who pulls our work apart. And in fact, God regards the work done in Christ as perfect. The jobs that you do for Christ are redeemed, and they look like the works of Christ. Even so, it's good to remember our shortcomings because it reminds us 
that we're just day laborers. We're not little gods, like some people think. Yeah, so Jesus says in Luke, So also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. And we need to be humble to realize that whether we've been Billy Graham or a housewife, the works that we've done are just the works of a day laborer equipped by God. Which brings us to the second reason that this parable isn't unfair, and that's that all the works we do in serving Jesus aren't actually our works at all. They are God's. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says, if I can read it, and I won't turn around. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's works done in us. And the watchword here is grace. Don't think uh, of God's work being the work that you do as being a denial of your talent and your hard work. Rather, Paul is saying that the work you do, however great or small, if it's in Christ, is in, of eternal value because it's the initiative of the eternal God who is at work in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2, uh, verse 13. And so, in God's eyes, there is no difference in value between the apostle, or the missionary, and the servant who sweeps a room, as unto the Lord. And as the poet George Herbert wrote, thereby transforms the work into a vision of heaven. Most Christians down history have had very little choice in the career paths they, ch they take. And yet to be a servant is as meritorious with God working in a, a servant's heart as in the Apostle Paul. There's an equality because all the works that we do in Christ come from God. Isn't that good? So if you're on a kind of a mundane job or your family are difficult, these are God's works that you've been called into. And so we have no reason to be proud except of him, and yet every reason to rejoice in what we've achieved in our service, whatever form that might take. The third reason it's not unfair is that Jesus has rather undersold the reward that his laborers work for. Uh, the vineyard's owner's denarius is the national minimum wage of a day laborer and I think Jesus uses that to teach us humility to remind us hey you day laborers guys don't think of yourselves more highly than you should but the Bible actually teaches us that the reward that all believers equally receive which is actually a free gift rather than a wage is nothing less than participating in or being united with everything everything that Jesus Christ is in his resurrection and glorification. That's quite a good denarius worth, isn't it? I've used the, the well done of my crusader chorus as shorthand in this talk, but we're not talking about some graduation ceremony where we queue up for a certificate and a handshake from Jesus, you know? Well done. Next. <laughs> we will dwell individually with Jesus forever, forever, don't ask me how, because our union with Jesus will be complete, closer even than marriage. That'll be the union we have, we will see God face to face. And that means not only complete forgiveness, but freedom from all temptation, eternal life before the face of God, a renewed and perfect and glorious spiritual body dwelling in an entire new creation, new stuff all the time, and even somehow sharing in Christ's rule of the universe. Are you up for that? I has not seen... Oops. Yeah, I don't think I did a slide for that. Who would hanker after a mansion and a private jet after that? except the celebrity preachers who have no other reward than that. 
But one word of warning as I close. Uh, the vineyard owner asks the latecomers why they're still standing around. And they reply that it's because nobody's employed them. And as we've seen, God's grace is the same whether you've never known a time without God, because you were that high when you became a Christian, or whether you're the thief being crucified next to Jesus. The reward is the same. But none of those workers in the vineyard have been down in the pub calculating how long they can leave it to get a day's wage with the minimum work. Hearing the gospel of Christ, hearing about sin, about repentance, about the cross and the resurrection and the lordship of Christ, makes you accountable for your response from that moment on before God's throne. And it could be that some of you here today have never made that response before. And if so, now is the time, because you can never be sure that the vineyard owner will come looking for you again. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to close by using my Crusader Chorus as a prayer. Believers can pray it as a rededication if they like. But if you're not yet a disciple of Christ, I would urge you, since your eternal life and your peace with God depend on it, to pray it as a prayer of commitment to a life of extraordinary interest and joy and some suffering. But for what a reward. Let's pray. The Lord has need of me. His soldier I will be. He gave himself my life to win. And so I mean to follow him and serve him faithfully. So although the fight be fierce and long, I'll carry on, he makes me strong. And then one day his face I'll see, and oh the joy when he says to me, well done, my brave crusader. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the same first time, don't leave before speaking to someone, either me or one of the guys with lanyards. And, and we'll kind of help you on your way and pray for you. Over to the band, I think. Oh. I have a job. <laughs> 59 years. <laughs> and Estelle, I think it's your special birthday today. You are 80. <laughs> 